support them? So they're generally in support, Jared. Have they done any work along those lines themselves or are they just, it just heard the topic? At right now, just aware of the topic and we're working, uh, we've been working for the last year or so on uh, Imagine Downtown 2030, which is our new strategic plan. And we're getting ready to make that public um, here later this year and, and ADUs are mentioned in the housing section. So something we definitely want to uh, work on and, and track and if, if we can help change policy, you know, all the better. But uh, they do play a, a prominent role in, in that portion of the strategic plan. So something that we want to build on. Oh, that's good. That's great. Good news. I'm glad we're doing this. Randy, you're back. I talked about you. I had a neighborhood, a community, a neighborhood meeting in South Kansas City. We were talking about something, and I got to, to talk about you. And so I don't know if somebody called you or not, but I mentioned. Mm -hmm. you. And then Jess, Jess, where where are you? Uh, where are you from, Jess? Beddingfield with CDBG. What is that for the which entity? Jess, are you there? Sorry, I couldn't unmute. There you are. <laughs> um, so I'm from Utah. Um, we're reevaluating our housing in some of our fastest growing counties. And they said, Jessica, go figure this out. So I searched online and found you guys. And I thought this could be a cool way to add some wow. housing into our commercial and ski areas. That is so interesting. All the way from Utah. You may have some good insight for us here in the Midwest too. We're glad. It's you're amazing here. that you found us. That's kind of crazy. Too. How, how did you find us? Is the question. How did you find us? I found you guys through Eventbrite. They okay. have some really yeah. cool events that you can find all around the world. Right, right. That's right. Oh, well, Jess, are you in Salt Lake City? I'm actually in Provo, so about okay. 45 minutes south of Salt Lake. I know a large contingent. Uh, from Kansas City was just out there last week as part of our Chambers Leadership Exchange. And so I didn't know if you had interacted with, with any Kansas Cityans, but it, it sounds like maybe you're just outside of their area. Yeah, just a bit. Right. And then I just saw, who did I see? Stacy. She disappeared. Okay, she's gone. And Catalina, where do you join us from? Oh, Union Hill. I see. Were you with us before? No, I just currently, I'm, I have an echo because it's on my phone. I, I just currently you... moved in with my son-in-law and daughter-in-law and we're looking to build a, um, an ADU over, the, over our garage. So I'm looking. Interesting. Interesting. We had someone from Union Hill with us last time too. And then, um, oh, Ali, oh, I'm sorry. She had a little, little echo going on there. Right, right. Ali is here. Ali is a, a fellow housing provider. Good to see you, Ali. Glad you're here. Yeah. Hey, guys. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And then um, Katie. Did we see Katie before? Katie, I don't think you were at our last meeting, were you? Sorry, having some tech problems. No, I was not. This is my first time popping in to listen to this one. Okay, we're glad you're here. And I see Derek Ramsey, who is a, um, he is with the Realtors. He represents Realtors and there are over 12,000 of us in the metro area. Welcome, Derek, glad you're here. Hey everybody, sorry, I'm having dinner, so. What are you eating? <laughs> what are you having? Um, I'm, I'm actually eating steamed broccoli. Oh. Hey, <laughs> thank you. Sounds very healthy. You, you, yeah. You, yeah, you caught me on a good night. <laughs> You can keep it. And then Laura, we know you were here last time. Yes. yes. I remember. I remember. And Eric too. Okay. Very good. And then you saw Miss Yonker. So, okay. That's great. Welcome everybody. I'm, I'm not trying to welcome everybody, but I'm just looking at the room. <laughs> just saying hi. Speaker. Okay. Shall we begin? You think? Um, yeah. Yeah, why don't we get started? Uh, mostly just because I got a lot to do tonight, so I don't want this to drag on too terribly long. Um, and we have several people who were here last time. I think it looks like we have about half the group that was here last time and half that wasn't. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and it sounds like 
most of you all here have a pretty strong familiarity with ADUs and what they are. Okay, so why don't I turn it over to Craig to just say, uh, we can say hello and we can start the conversation. Good evening and welcome everybody. I'm Craig Eichelman. I'm the state director in Missouri for AARP. And in the 2019 mayoral election, we fielded a survey to 800 likely voters over the age of 50 and housing affordability was the number one issue. So uh, we started looking for partners to uh, sharpen that knife in our drawer and build good relationships at City Hall to affect policy. So we're really happy to be part of this ADU conversation. And Stacy, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Craig. I am Stacy Johnson Cosby. I am a realtor and I'm also a housing provider. And I'm the president of the Casey Regional Housing Alliance, which is a partner in this um, coalition along with Kevin and Laura. And our goal is to create more housing and also to create more affordable housing and preserve what we currently have as well. Our alliance represents realtors, property managers, investors, and landlord groups. And Collectively with our membership across all of them in the region, we represent over 100,000 rental units. And so this is something that's important to us. We've also created an affordable um, housing policy paper. And we also list ADUs as another way that um, cities and, and communities can increase the housing units that we need. And then Laura, 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 kind of tripping over the words here. You want to say hello? Hi, I'm Laura Loyacano. Um, I live uh, in South Kansas City, but I've lived in a lot of places, including uh, Midtown for a long time, and um, I'm really happy to be working with AARP and helping um, focus the discussion around community livabilities and uh, assisting AARP in reaching out to all the neighborhood associations. This is just one, we realize just one strategy in um, creating more housing opportunities, but it's a, it's a good one. So it's um, nice to see everyone here and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you all. And, and uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Kevin Klinkenberg. I'm the executive director of Midtown KC Now. I'm also just kind of a perennial troublemaker and, uh, and this, this, this kind of falls in the category of things that I like to uh, talk about on my own. And uh, this is not a Midtown KC Now effort, but it's certainly something our organization is interested in. <clears throat> More of an interest of mine uh, and something I've uh, had an interest in for a very long time uh, and have had the good fortune to build an ADU and have a, have a home, have a couple different homes that had them. So have some direct experience and, and have enjoyed the benefits. I would love to see more people be able to enjoy the benefits uh, of them. Um, so it looks like we've got a pretty sophisticated group on our hands here tonight. Is there anybody um, who just doesn't feel comfortable with the knowing what we're talking about when we talk about ADUs and, and that we'll have some more basic questions about what they are and uh, and what we're talking about when we use these kind of wonky urban planning terms. <laughs> yeah, don't be shy if you want to. We, we feel free to speak up. So, guys, this is Jess. Um, I was wondering exactly what size you guys count as an ADU. You know, that's a that's a good question. What I have seen around the country is that it's just all over the map in what people consider in terms of a, uh, a size. In, in, in my mental framework, what I have always started with is thinking about like a, a garage apartment. That's the most common version of what, you know, we often mean when we talk about an ADU. So that could be anywhere from 300 to 700 square feet. Um, if it's, if it's over a garage, for example. Um, and I think somewhere in that range is more typical, um, but, I, but I have seen them as big as a thousand square feet. I've seen them as small as a 120 square foot tiny home. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of range in there. I think one of the main things that we talk about when we start getting into the weeds about legislation and ordinances, is you, won't, you don't want them to be larger than the principal house on the lot. So they need to, you know, we, we, part of the, the goal and what makes them so attractive is a great way to provide housing that blends into a neighborhood that people often don't notice uh, very much. And so having that size be smaller than the main house is important. 
so that said, there are also, we talked about this last time, there are other ways to define ADUs that could be, uh, it could be a basement uh, apartment, it could be a, a third story apartment in a three story house, um, it could be a, a wing attached onto the back of a house. Um, so it could be like a physical attachment, but um, there are, so there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to possibly create one. Hey, Stacy, glad to see you. Stacy Garrett, the realtor, right? Yes, she is. And then Angie just joined us as well. So I think Angie was here last time also. Um, so this is great. You know what it might be helpful is if, if people can figure out how to do it to put, rename yourself or maybe put what neighborhood or organization you're representing just to keep us set focused. Or in chat, maybe. Yeah. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Pat, Laura? Chat would be great. Yeah, that's easy. Um, Jess, did that? Did you have any other uh, questions that were more along those lines? No, that makes sense. I just have a hard time describing that to my local elected officials because there's such a wide range. I didn't know if there's a better way to start the conversation. We have some really great images uh, from. I, I've got this, you know, very quick and dirty presentation I've put together about ADUs that I'd be happy to send to you if you uh, drop your email in the chat. That and, would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome to have any of those images. Um, but I think definitely the it's such a visual thing when talking about buildings. It's always helpful to have the visuals to help orient people. OK, before we jump in, I, I was hoping we could use take some time tonight to dive a little bit deeper into the topic of uh, owner occupancy. That seemed like a kind of a recurring comment last time uh, on a number of fronts. Uh, before we did that, I wanted to just see if there were other issues um, left hanging from last time that you wanted to talk about or like Jared or um, Katie or some of you who weren't here last time, are there more burning questions that you have as you've looked at this issue that you'd like to talk about? Um, before we get into like owner occupancy. Well, Kevin, just to make sure I'm clear, ADUs are not currently allowed in Kansas City. Is that correct? I mean, I, you might just talk about kind of the current policy environment to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's kind of tricky. Um, and we learned last time that there are some, you know, unusual exceptions that you may not, we may not all be aware of, but in general, in Kansas City, Missouri, you can build one, but you cannot rent it. Um, so it you could technically build one, but you're not allowed to rent it um, out to anything other than family members. Um, so that obviously sharply limits um, the utilization of them because most people uh, who are looking at building one are thinking that at some point, even if even if they have a family member in mind, they're probably thinking at some point I may rent this out uh, as well. Um, so uh, effectively, very, very few are ever built uh, in Kansas City or have been in recent years, even though we have uh, dozens and dozens of them all over our historic neighborhoods. Um, so there are some exceptions. Hyde Park apparently has uh, some except, you know, a, a process they've worked out to have some. Um, and then outside Kansas City, Missouri, in the metro area, there are some cities where you're allowed to build them. Um, so North Kansas City, uh, I think KCK is getting ready to uh, allow them. Uh, I did some work years ago in places like Blue Springs and, and a few others where they're allowed in limited conditions. So um, that's kind of where we are. Um, Kevin, will you give background on the ordinance and why we're, I, I know you touched on it, why we're here and what our goal is with a new ordinance to, to make this legal in Kansas City? Yeah, so our, our interest as a group was to try to talk to some neighborhoods and neighborhood leaders especially and try to figure out um, if we had some support for uh, what I would say is re-legalizing ADUs because in our historic footprint uh, of the city, they were, they were legal, you know, since the inception of the city was was created all the way really up through probably the 1950s or 60s um, and 
Um, obviously, there's lots and lots of them from the end of the 19th century to the early 20th century that are built. So um, there's been a real interest in this topic nationally as a way to provide more housing, especially more housing affordably, uh, and especially in neighborhoods um, like we have here uh, in the urban core. Um, and so we've been working with AERP and others to try to figure out, and a couple of council people who are interested in creating an ordinance that basically permits these um, it, it might be they're geographically limited, like we might not do the whole city of Kansas City, but we might look at certain zoning districts or certain parts of the city. Um, the three of us or four of us, have we've, as we've talked about it, we've kind of started with the framework of like the, the 1940 city limits, um, which is about 80, 80 square miles. Um, so it's, it's basically what most of us consider the urban core, uh, that part of the historic part of the city. Um, but there are other ways to think about it too. And, there, and as we've talked about this and Stacy and Laura in particular, there, there may be other places in South Kansas City, maybe even some north of the river that might really want it um, or want to have that option. And, and so we want to think about including that as a possibility too. Um, so, but the goal ultimately is to help uh, create an ordinance that has some support with it before, before city council like has a public hearing and then they will go through their typical public hearing process um, and uh, do what they need to do. And we didn't want an ordinance thrown out there where we didn't have an opportunity to have input and to have neighborhood input, which again, like Kevin said, is why we're doing this. We only really want neighborhoods that want it. Um, and for example, in my South Kansas City neighborhood and umbrella group, we had a meeting and I didn't get to tell you guys this yet, but they are, um, they're not in favor of it because of the style of homes that we have in Redbridge. They're thinking it, it just doesn't fit with our area. And so our goal was not to do a blanket ordinance that covers the entire city where people, and we know they will, would come out and fight against it and testify against it. We want it to be more inclusive, which is why we're doing this today. And so a question that I, I personally have is, what do, what do you all think about it? And what do you think about for your neighborhoods? And do you have areas in particular that you think it would be welcome, that ADUs would be welcome? Somebody, anybody? Yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'll just go. We've had um, some discussions about this, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, as we talk about affordable housing and, and options. Um, and I guess, maybe a comment and a question, what, maybe six months ago or so, there was a proposal and the way they couched it was to um, allow anywhere from one to four units in, in a, an R1 zoned area, for instance. And, and I think when you talk about elimination of a single family zoning code, that really rubs people the wrong way. And so I, I'm curious if that's, Kevin, kind of the road you guys are, are going down or, or would it be more of a plan commission, special use permit type of uh, application? I just, I just know when that came up, um, I got a lot of pushback from, from my members and, and that, that's a constituency that we really need to get uh, behind this. And, and, and I would love to, to see something happen, but I think if we talk about completely eliminating single family zoning or, or, or something that, that could even be categorized as that, you're gonna get a lot of a lot of pushback. Yeah, that's a good question, Derek. Um, I think we're still trying to kind of figure that out. Um, I think this is, I'm thinking about it as very targeted uh, so that it would just be about um, uh, ADUs, wouldn't be about anything else. We're not talking about um, triplexes, fourplexes as part of this. This is strictly looking at ADUs and probably really prioritizing the districts that already accommodate, um, like the reality is most of the zoning districts, um, say north of Brush Creek uh, anyway, already allow for duplexes um, by right. Um, so this would probably take that and maybe expand it to some of those other uh, districts, you know, like in Brookside and um, Northeast, East Side, et cetera. Uh, where you could, you'd be allowed to have um, the ADU, you'd be able to allow to have the house and an ADU. And that's really about it. We're not, I don't think we're looking beyond any of that. 
Uh, so at our last HKC board meeting, we had a discussion about that. It seems to the three things that came up was um, governance. Uh, nobody on our board was too um, um, too confident that it would actually there there would be a mechanism put in place that would make sure that everybody plays by the rules. And there's a lot of skepticism in Bidtown about um, about that. So governance was a, a discussion that was discussed quite a bit. Um, the parking issues. There was still a lot of people that think that um, uh, there is uh, uh, continued pressure on our neighborhoods with respect to uh, uh, density increases and in parking um, uh, uh, that increases on the street and the, and some concerns about what that causes. And then we got into a big discussion about how do we control short-term rentals, um, which already is a problem <clears throat> to some, to That's some, fine. and I'm not saying it's a problem in my perception, but some see it as a as an issue with respect to how that continues to get regulated or uh, controlled, even though that they do have a permitting process. So those are the three things that uh, that I think were we kind of dwelled on uh, in our last meeting, Kevin. I am going to go for another walk. I'm going to listen to this while I walk. It's, uh, that's. Great feedback, Eric. Appreciate that. Sure. We had we also had a discussion at our. I got a chance to present this to our Volker neighborhood meeting. Uh, Doris, were you were you on that one? I couldn't remember. Where no, uh, I'm <laughs> here strictly to learn more about them. Okay, For Westport. I'm from Westport. The heart of Westport. Right. All right. Um, I, I felt like the conversation was really good, and there was a lot of really good feedback. I, I, again, it kind of focuses on similar issues that you talked about, Eric. Um, most of the conversations I've had revolve around uh, Airbnb comes up a lot um, and um, and then parking uh, to a lesser degree. Uh, and that's really person by person. And, and again, I would say with you, I'm not here to say those are issues for me or that, um, et cetera, but those are certainly issues for some people as we talk about, um, talk about how these might be implemented. The governance question is really important, and I think as we even think about owner, the discussion about owner occupancy, we'd have to really have an honest uh, discussion about what that means, because um, there is, uh, in at least in our city, in Kansas City, Missouri, um, oversight is spotty on a lot of issues. Um, I, I want to ask a question of Eric. Eric, can you share like what you see with the short term rentals, the, the issues and how the neighborhood responds and with the city, how, how they're handling that with governance, like you said? Well, I, I'm not so sure that I can articulate a lot of the concerns. Um, it, it seems to me the biggest one is control of who, the, who they rent to. Um, there were two or three or four board members that were describing, you know, these worst case scenarios where the short term rental would would get rented by a, a group of fraternity party animals and uh, the terrible disruption on the street. And uh, it wouldn't be one car of a, of a four person family going to a Big 12 basketball tournament. It would be eight cars of guys getting together for you know, a bachelor's party. So, you know, I think the fear of the unknown was something that continues to kind of uh, um, kind of haunt that industry. I actually think it's a, a, a good way of providing affordable housing, affordability for people that want to restore old historic homes uh, because it brings a revenue stream that allows them to, to do that if they're so willing. But that, that seemed to be the thing that, um, um, that they dwelled on was the control of who the, the renters are. Uh, the other thing is um, the permitting process appears to not actually do a very good job of policing um, illegal short-term rentals. Um, and so going back to um, how does the 311 network work for the neighborhood preservation department 
with respect to, you know, reporting violations or zoning code violations, uh, property maintenance violations, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's that's a lot of the discussion that we had. Hey, Eric, um, did you did you say would you say that it's a fear of the unknown? I was just wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Were you saying that people had personal experiences with the short term rental? fraternity, the fraternity example existed or are they more afraid that that might happen? Well, I think there's been some, let's say, uh, spotty incidences where that's happened that people have either heard about or know somebody who's experienced it. Uh, but in my own experience, knowing people that do short-term rentals, there's a simple way around that. And that's how you vet your clients, right? and uh, how you police your clients, your customers. Uh, so, you know, I don't see that as an issue, but it certainly was a very uh, discussed topic um, on the board. Um, board members uh, represent, um, just so you know, uh, Roanoke, Hyde Park, Valentine, Old Hyde Park, um, for the most part, they're all Midtowners. So. Yeah, it's a it's it's a really interesting and tough quandary. Those those examples do exist. Um, you know, they they happen, um, especially with the whole house rentals. Uh, you know, on Airbnb, um, they're often you know done uh, under the radar or you know under the official rules, but um, they happen. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to deny that. Um, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a tough quandary. Certainly my experience in Savannah, Eric, was um, it kind of had both those things that you talked about. On the one hand, there was a lot of angst about uh, Airbnb taking over the historic district and use, having party houses and a lot of short-term rentals. On the other hand, it was also an enormous catalyst to renovate uh, mm -hmm. an awful lot of historic properties that were not really getting renovated. Mm -hmm. um, because it brought a revenue stream that was just far and above what normal rentals did. So it's, you know, it's a catch 22. Um, it it kind of depends on how you look at it, you know, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, Laura, uh, Laura Burkhalter, I know you all have had some recent, a lot of recent discussion about Airbnbs in South Moreland. Is that, what's that been like? Uh, um, you know, those, I feel like Eric really ticked a lot of the boxes of the concerns that residents have had in our neighborhood. We do have quite a few, um, and we have a lot that are not registered. And, you know, we floated, you know, after the first meeting of this, I kind of brought this topic up to some of our residents that are interested um, and they're both, you know, condo owners and homeowners alike. Um, and their concerns were, well, we don't want, we would support the idea of ADUs, but we don't want them to become short-term rentals. And, um, you know, we all are aware that there's not a whole lot of guidance or policing or uh, oversight of the short-term rentals. So, I think there'd have to be some strides made in that direction for people to have a more more of a comfort zone um, with, you know, ADUs. Kevin, I uh, I don't know if this is going to be helpful or not, but I sat in on a presentation. Um, it was in in the Chicago area, and there's a fellow who got the ADU ordinances sort of passed and this conversation was coming up and and one thing he just cautious like look these are expensive to build he says and i would say the majority of people put them he put the number at like 80 percent is our granny flats to building it for an elderly parent or, or in-law um but of course then you know what do you do with it you know 15 years from now you know do you rent it to do something else but it's you need the money and, and generally it's, it's family. Uh, and you, you had an ADU, so you probably had a different experience, but he has just seen that as the, just the overwhelming trend. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's true. And it, you know, really differs market by market. I think the other thing, um, 
you know, we always have to keep in mind too, like there's always a fear of like Airbnbs taking over a neighborhood, but we also, there, there's a market limitation on how many Airbnbs are ever really going to be successful. I mean, this is not New Orleans. Uh, we're not uh, a major tourist uh, city that draws a ton of traffic like that. There's, there's certainly a market for some, but I mean, even on my block here, there was uh, there was an apartment down the street that was on Airbnb and um, it wasn't working for them. And so they turned it over and, and now they're just doing typical long-term rentals with it. Um, so everything hits a saturation point based on what, you know, the market will demand. Um, and I, I don't know where that is and nobody knows where that is and, and until things roll out. And it probably is really different in every neighborhood, like Laura in your neighborhood next to the Art Institute and the Nelson and near the Plaza, there's probably a much higher demand there than there would be, you know, in other uh, neighborhoods in the city. I did see a, a survey from AARP and I think maybe another one from um, American Planning Association. And it said the overwhelming number of ADUs in this country were used for family members, either the family member moved in or the, or the, or the older family moved into the ADU and let their younger family live there. And then the second most popular reason was for someone who was disabled, either a family member or friend. Um, so that they could continue living there. Yeah, yeah. So I not a lot for income, not a lot that are using it to generate um, income for the family. That was also very, you know, very popular. They maybe even rent it out to a family member, but usually it is used by rented, mm -hmm. used to house someone that they know. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised at all by that because it just offers a lot more flexibility. And then, you know, sometimes you have an aging family member who sells a house to move, move into an ADU to be closer to their family or something else, maybe a college kid coming home. Um, uh, who knows what, there's a lot of different um, arrangements possible there. And I, I've heard of people that need more income. So they rent out um, the space just to generate more income for their um, household. Right. Um, and so and they generally live there, right? Um, in one part of the, and then the, they rent out the other part, so. I mean, that was my, my experience when I did it. Um, I used it for income uh, primarily. There was a brief period of time um, where we had some family members staying, but it was always for income for me because it was, um, frankly, it was just an amazing way to like make your mortgage next to nothing. Uh, and so it was, it was a great way to live in a, in a nicer place very inexpensively. Uh, and so the, to me, that had a ton of appeal. Uh, and I chose my own tenants, you know, they were living on my property. So I chose them really carefully um, and never really had an issue. But um, that, I mean, that, everybody's going to have a different approach. Mm -hmm. right. right. And so something else that I found helpful last time Randy shared with us, because we hear negative things about short term rentals. And I think this tells us that we need to be very careful to distinguish the difference and make sure people know that ADUs are long term. And then like Kevin, like you said, it's almost like a duplex. It's just two units on one property. Um, but um, Randy, I think one of the things you said last time is most of the applications and you serve on the um, BZA, is that right? Yep. And so those short-term rentals come to your commission and most of them have neighborhood support and most of them are passed and approved. Is that right? Yeah, so the ones that come to us are the applicants that could not get it's a percentage of their neighbors to sign off on their application essentially so then they come to us for their special use permit approval and the ones that we've denied have been the ones that the neighbors are not in favor if it was a party house or something like that then usually the neighborhood comes out in full force says they're not on board with this and then we don't grant them the ability to continue to do that so um, a lot of them do get neighborhood support, letters of support from the neighborhood associations. And so we see that if, if they're in good conversations with the neighborhood and the neighborhood has no issue, then there must be something that's working and we you know, allow it to continue for two more years and they have to come back and reapply just to make sure they're still in a good, good standing with the neighborhood. So I would think those kind of neighborhoods that are okay with the turnover and traffic like that should be absolutely fine with, um, with ADUs. Can you name like a couple or a few of those neighborhoods that if we haven't talked about them yet? Um, so the, most of the ones that just for Airbnbs that come to us, is that what you're saying yes. for that, is the, the downtown core. I mean, I don't think we've seen anything. We saw a couple down, quite a ways down south, but most things are, you know, Brookside to River Market, kind of in that range. 
in the houses, like Kevin says and pointed out to us, that are built before, like 1940s and before. Yeah, yeah okay. most of them are all older homes that they have. Either they're renting out the entire house or they have a third floor that they're renting out that had separate access, something like that. Okay, so that confirms what Kevin observed. So that's good. Interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's good. Um, and if I could ask a question, we have um, Stacy, you're a realtor, and I think you're in my office, um, Reese Nichols Plaza. Do you have like any thoughts about ADUs and how it would be um, absorbed, absorbed in our marketplace and what people would think in various neighborhoods? Hey there, everyone. Yeah, Great. I think, hi. Uh, yeah, I think um, in general, the, the positioning toward ADUs is uh, leaning positive. And I agree it's really important to tease apart the concept of ADUs for with short-term rentals, because even for Union Hill, that comes up regularly as a concern in terms of the city enforcing uh, the application process and you know how does the neighborhood position themselves. So to that point, I don't think Union Hill is alone uh, in the concerns. However, the trend for even in the in midtown urban core is to maximize housing opportunities. So I think it's a worthwhile endeavor to pursue a path to where we can gain success for ADUs and get them uh, back on the docket. And maybe we could uh, frame it up for you know family members, uh, for support, even for children with disabilities. Um, it's a clear need that is important for us to pay attention to and overcome some of the objectives so we could get it approved. Good, thank you. Thank you. Hey, do you know that there's an application fee right now for Airbnb, correct? So, is that right, Randy? Do you know that? I believe that's the case. Do we have any sense of how much that generates? Mm. I'm just thinking out loud, and, and Kevin, I'd look to you or, or Craig, if, or maybe even Jess in, in your research, but if you were to layer- well, We can check that out and find out, I think. Yeah, if you were to layer that with any potential fees for ADUs, you know, could that potentially generate enough for a, an entry level staff member at City Hall to address some of these concerns with the new housing department? If we could go to the neighborhood and say, look, there will be a, a full time staff member that is there to provide support, um, oversight, governance, you know, handle grievances or concerns mm -hmm. that might help kind of soften some of the opposition if they know that there's a dedicated person working on this uh, based on those fees. And, and so just wanted to toss that out there and see if we know of any other city that's doing that. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jared. And I think that'd be a good way to, to think about that and look at that. Because I think there's not only a registration, but maybe an annual fee uh, for a short-term rental. Um, yeah, Kevin, I want to say it's 500 bucks, five. 25 something like that and there's different um there are different regulations and i think a different fee structure if you're um less than 30 days or more than 30 days there's kind of a, a yeah. longer term that, that that's in that same licensure and then um so so i think that's i think that's a good model to follow um and kind of back to uh something that randy said earlier um i remember when uh, when we were working the uh, uh, urban chicken ordinance and um, not not exactly the same but but when it comes to dealing with your neighbors um, a point that we pushed was that that public input you know just like with a zoning case you have to notify residents within 500 feet or whatever that requirement is there's a comment period they have the opportunity to come down and testify when when that license is being considered and we always figured that um, you know your neighbors are the best uh, the best gauge of whether or not you're going to be a responsible property owner. That um, you know if you're parking your your, your car in the front yard uh, every night, maybe we work on that before we let you uh, uh, have an ADU. But but if if the the feedback from your neighbors is positive, I want to say I think we did a a one year temporary permit, and then if at the end of that that year. Um, everything was good and there were no violations, no complaints. 
um, it got automatically extended after after they verified that information uh, for for another four years. So you might look at, at something like that, maybe a, an interim period. Recommend that there's you know not only input from the neighbors, but but a, a review opportunity somewhere within that first 12 months that, that they can make sure that they're being responsible, responsible neighbors. And I think that would go a long way to get um, uh, to get some of the people that might be skeptical about this opportunity, um, you know, on board, or at least not opposing. One piece, of, one piece of advice we got, Craig, Craig and I were on a call a couple of weeks ago with, uh, with somebody that actually ARP employees right now who's an expert in model legislation. And he was pointing out that in terms of code enforcement or application, not to single out ADUs because, you know, neighbors could, you know, take after, you know, they, if they didn't like somebody or as an elected official or somebody, but that to look at ADUs is just another housing option and that, you know, you would chalk it in with lots of other permits that the city would do and not hold them out to be, to need a um, special oversight, which I thought was interesting, but we definitely will look into that money for the applications for short-term rentals. So yeah. what it sounds like you're looking for is not a, 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 a vehicle by which you're asking Randy to, to hear a special use permit uh, for a case by case basis, but basically, a zoning change uh, by ordinance that would allow a process for city planners to basically say, check the box, it works in this, this district, it, uh, it meets all the regulations, and so they can approve the construction permit, um, something as simple as that. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair, Eric. Um, it, and I might even expand that a little bit with some nuance to just say, there might be parts, certain districts or parts of the city where it is a simple, it's part of the zoning and it's easy to check a box to do it. And there might be other areas where you allow for it as a special use and they have to go through the special use permit process uh, and go to BZA or whatever to get it. Um, and so that might expand some of the possibilities of where they could be potentially. You know, it seems to me that the argument might be that you and Stacy and others use is that you're actually promoting lighter density in a lot of these urban neighborhoods than you know multifamily, uh, where you've got by uh, you know blight it and abate it mentality with people scraping blocks of uh, you know residential houses and putting up you know larger apartment complexes. You're really trying to allow for the existing housing stock to stay intact as uh, you know, smaller investors or developers being homeowners. Um, you know, and then Stacy, you mentioned Redbridge. Um, if I look at post-World War II housing, uh, one of the experiences I've had is a lot of the times people are looking at detached garages with living space above those garages as a way of expanding their own living area because they really don't have logistically the, the, the ability to build out quote the ranch or the Cape Cod or even a split level in a way that, um, that, that works on their lot. Whereas they can build out uh, a detached garage uh, within a uh, much uh, more flexible uh, setback requirement way back in the rear yard. Um, so it, it's really not too much of a stretch to say, okay, um, and college towns do this all the time where they've got the, you know, the space above the garage um, where they'll rent it out um, to, you know, a, a student on a, on, a, on a college year basis. Um, maybe the kid comes home from college and you, you've outgrown your house, but you weren't expecting college kids to come home. Um, and all of a sudden that they don't fit in your two bedroom ranch or two bedroom Cape Cod. So you build that space out and then you rent it out. It's, I think it works as well in post-World War II housing if the lot allows the driveway to access to the rear yard uh, as much as it does um, uh, the, the pre-1940 housing stock. So just That's a good opinion. Point. And, and the basement, the basement too, because our houses have basements. And so that's an, an option too. So, you'll, I, but but you'll see in college campuses uh, a lot of change in zoning over the years to allow 
rental properties within a certain walking distance of campus. And that's really why, to try to meet the need of uh, the student population. And that, that makes sense. But one thing that um, to tag on to what Derek said, I think that if we try to change zoning, single family zoning, that would be a huge deal. One of the people in my meeting um, sent an article after our meeting and said that, you know, the somewhere I guess in California, where they are trying to do that or, or places, certain places where they've eliminated that single family zoning, that would be a huge problem. I think not only for realtors, but neighborhoods, no, no one, I don't think wins with that. In, in our town in particular. Yeah, that's uh, certainly been an issue on the West Coast, been a hot, hot button item there from the state level. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric, those are great points. You might have to update your uh, first suburbs uh, housing book to show how they could be ADUs. We'll look into that. Yeah. <laughs> what other questions? Sorry, Stacy, you were jumping in. The same thing you were going to say, I was just going to ask Ali as a um, as an investor with multiple properties, his input, like we've heard from Stacy with kind of from the real estate angle. Um, Ali, what would you say from a um, the angle of an investor? Ali, are you there? <laughs> All right, maybe not. And then Sharon has joined us um later here sharon um can you tell us where where you are what neighborhood you're in kansas city missouri okay uh, and west plaza west plaza okay terrific and do you have any questions for us do you have any familiarity with this topic of adus or any questions for us on it no i don't have any questions i just wanted to listen okay great what about ann anything from ann Hi guys, hey. um, I am listening in. I'm actually on a walk, walking around seeing where in my neighborhood there might be some ADUs I didn't notice, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm really on a learning curve here. So um, yeah, I don't have any questions, but I'm finding it's very interesting. And you know, with I'm with the downtown council and we obviously have all the tall multifamily, but you know, we're interested in and helping preserve housing in the neighborhoods adjacent to us. So I'm, I'm really just trying to understand the issues more. Great. So thank you. you I know, think we're all learning too. <laughs> yeah, one, of the, one of the comments Eric made was sort of thinking about it as a lighter version of density. I remember earlier this year, I did just a quick analysis of, of my neighborhood in, in Volcker. Volcker is a pretty big neighborhood. Um, now, if I, I did a quick search and looking at just the yep. southern half of the neighborhood between 30, 39th Street to Westport Road, uh, state line to the Southwest Traffic Way, there is just a little over a thousand parcels in that area, uh, two thirds of which are single family homes uh, today. So even, even if only like a third of those single family homeowners had any interest in doing an ADU, that's 200 possible units in one portion of one neighborhood, um, and you know we're pretty used we're pretty used to getting 200 unit apartment complexes proposed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, just imagine, you know, just imagine what that means um, for the cities to have that possibility. Of course, it would never happen all at once. It would happen over a period of many years. Sure. Um, so it's a it's a different animal. And um, Kevin, Ali's back on. And I'm I gonna, I'm gonna go wanted to hear. There he is. Ali, you're talking. Ali, we wanted to hear from you if you could share from an, inspe inspe an investor standpoint your thoughts on ADUs. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, because I'm looking at a trailer right now. I was looking at, sorry. But yeah, so from an investor standpoint, so where I, my rentals are at, uh, east of Troost, then I have a duplex in St. Joe. But with that situation with the parcels, because I was looking at the land bank today. There are so many just land, like open areas, like where that concept can like fit in. But like, like you said, like someone can suggest an apartment complex and like two or three like uh, slots and they can just get those approved. But in this sample, because that, that would work. Because let's say people can charge me two or 300 bucks. That's still cheaper than most rents. And a lot of people's lots and yards are pretty big. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
attractive for investors and the rent would be cheap. Yes, yeah. Okay, good, 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 thank you. Um, all right, what else, what else are we missing? What, what all would you like to, us to focus on next? I mean, one of the things we're gonna do is work with council members on a possible ordinance. Um, what, um, what all would you like to hear about next? Can we hear from Angie and, and Waldo? Yeah, yeah, Angie. Been thinking, you've been thinking about it for a long time. You guys, you said have been discussing it. And in your, uh, under your umbrella, you have over um, 3,000 properties. Um, so it'd be great to hear from you. Well, I, you know, I, I shared the video and everything uh, from our last meeting with our board. And basically everybody's just like, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. I don't know why we won't do it. So, <laughs> I mean... You we're pretty copacetic over here. Um, and you're the biggest uh, neighborhood association, right? Is I mean, one one? you know, the thing is like, we're not, we're not seeing a huge amount of engagement from members right now. So, you know, I can't say that 3000 people have heard this idea and agree. Um, so, I mean, you know, just as we s matriculate that information out, um, and continue to have meetings and continue to put this stuff in email, you know, then slowly they'll all start to hear about it. But um, like I said, I mean, it, it, it takes time for people to catch on that, oh, this, this might be something that affects me. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great that we're getting started and we're having this conversation. But, you know, the overall consensus in our neighborhood is we don't want to see people get priced out. Uh, we're really concerned about the elderly being priced out of their homes, the ones that are left here. Um, and I think that this would provide a really great opportunity for them to, you know, maybe rent out their house and still live uh, in a smaller unit or vice versa. So I think that this is this is something that we've already talked about to some extent as far as, you know, the need. Right. And that makes me right. and like Stacy um, can speak to, and, and we all, I think everybody has seen it. The price of housing is crazy. And if someone wants to live in a particular area, this may be a great way to get in the area. You know, if you're living in the ADU to, to kind of live in the area until the market changes, maybe hopefully, or until something becomes available. Right. I'm pretty sure that Diane's new building is renting for about, I don't know. 900 for a studio you're talking about in marlboro right in waldo. waldo the oh, new oh, the oh, new, the new waldo oh Heights. the new build right on 75th street that's right that's yeah. bought, diane bought one okay yeah, they're they're pricey and they're, there's a market for it right but but there's also two bedroom apartments for 900 dollars around you know so it's there's there's a really big discrepancy there Okay. Okay. Well, I think I was thinking. Hi, I was thinking the um, the point about you know the the rising rents is a powerful one uh, when talking with you know in changing legislation and and creating more housing for people who need it who can't afford to pay nine hundred dollars a month. I have clients who are searching in that space right now. And there, so there's a clear need for housing. Um, and so it, it could be a good, a good framing for the discussion to say, how do we, what multiple ways levers can we pull to solve this problem in Kansas City? Yeah. yeah. You know, My main concern has been for, uh, as I live in Westport, for the people who work in our stores and our companies. <laughs> that don't make the money that they would, it would be silly for them to pay a lot of money and who wants to live in a studio apartment when you're an adult? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kevin, I was gonna suggest that you look at the carriage house legislation or ordinances uh, in the different zoning districts and what they restrict and, and how they uh, allow it in certain places and maybe look at how that could get, that language could get modified to right. uh, accommodate this type of uh, dwelling unit. And then uh, obviously Craig's concern is accessibility. 
so it, it has to be more than just uh, space above a garage. Mm -hmm. um, most of the oldest houses uh, aren't very accessible from the sidewalks. Uh, they're usually raised up and they're not accessible even from the back backyard, but their garages most certainly are. Uh, uh, the first floor of their garages. So it's an easy transition conversion uh, for a garage to be made uh, uh, an accessible dwelling unit uh, if the first floor can be used as well as the second floor. Obviously the second floor isn't accessible, but um, the first floor could be. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's all kinds of logic that would allow you to uh, convert single family or to allow it. Um, there's probably language that could be refined that the council can read and look at that um, is is not starting totally from scratch. But yeah, in fact, it's interesting. That made me think of uh, a little project I did for a friend twelve or thirteen years ago, uh, who had a house in Midtown, and he had a just a one car uh, or single story garage in back. You know, it was which was kind of typical, and we added onto it uh, off to the side and built uh built it as like a recording studio um so you know and there was plenty of room on the property to build that out that that could very easily have been just a single level apartment as well you know if, if we if that's what he wanted to do and it would have been an accessible unit then in that case so yeah it's a good point is there anything that um katie or catalina i don't think we've heard from you anything you might want to add I'm, I might I might keep in mind the idea of owner occupation throughout this because I think you know in our neighborhood in South Moreland, like we discussed, there's been a lot of Airbnb and other short-term rental coming in, and a lot of that has been investor-owned kind of absentee owner, and I think that's um, would be a point of contention and concern for a lot of people in our neighborhood going forward is that that's kind of taking housing stock um, away from kind of neighborhood owners instead of just adding housing. Hi, this is Jess. Just to jump on that, I really am loving this idea of owner occupied. One of the main concerns um, my communities are saying is that my kids can't afford to live here. Well, it's really easy to come back and say, well, build an accessible dwelling unit and they can have your house. You can have a more accessible, senior friendly accessory dwelling unit and your kids can stay close by. Great point. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think I would just say as we get back to thinking about um, city, of, our city, city of Kansas City, Missouri, and how business is often done, we would have to think very hard about how that is described and regulated and overseen, um, because that is really tricky. You know, any like for example, anybody can buy a house today or a duplex or whatever, live in it for a while. Uh, move out of it and keep it and rent it. Um, and there's no mechanism to really oversee that. Um, the other problem with owner, owner occupied, uh, restricting it to over uh, owner occupied is if it ever did get go into foreclosure, get taken over the bank by a bank, a financer is not going to want that because they're, they're not going to be able to occupy um, a unit that they come in possession of so that was um that's just something to really watch out for which well, you know again it's just something we have to look at all aspects of that and what what it means from a legislative standpoint because it is that that raises a lot of complications uh, i know i know north kansas city did that uh, as part of their ordinance uh, i think they put an owner occupancy requirement on it and um you know they they haven't seen any new adus built um, right. either. Now it's also a very small city, um, very limited, you know, opportunities. So there might be other reasons for that, but that I just think we have to consider what all that means. Yeah, that's often called one of those poison pills, right? It seems like it's going to be helpful, but it really ends up hurting the purpose. And, and it might or might not be in Kansas City. You know, we, you don't really know until you put it into place. And this is a large city. We're talking about a lot of homes and everything else, but um, we just want to be make sure we think through the details of that. You know, another thing, Kevin, that um, would be interesting in terms of the argument um, is, you know, this notion about density. 
um, more people don't necessarily mean denser environment. Um, I don't think Kansas City and Randy might know this has ever has yet to limit on a single on a single family zoning uh, lot the maximum lot coverage from a percentage of lot acreage. Uh, you can still build from side yard setback to side yard setback, from front yard setback to rear yard setback, and maximize the lot coverage if you wanted to build a very large house. Um, many uh, first ring suburbs have done that to where you're limited on the amount of lot coverage that you can do for a house, but Kansas City, Missouri doesn't. So, you know, if somebody wanted to invest in a house, uh, a modest size house, um, and, and build a detached garage that can now go within four feet of the rear yard setback line and four feet of the side yard setback line, they actually create more open space while creating more revenue, quote, more value, than if they were to buy that, that small house, scrape it off the, the lot and build a mega mansion on what the zoning in Kansas City currently allows in every residential district. Uh, we've seen that in uh, the Westwood neighborhood of uh, Kansas City, just west of the plaza. Uh, maybe West Plaza has done that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not so sure the density arguments actually holds water when you can actually get more open space if you allow for a detached structure um, to an accessory unit, accessory structure to uh, be utilized that uh, don't necessarily, or that will allow the encroachment into the rear yard setback like a garage can. So I think that you can, you can also have that kind of discussion and show people what and I see Brandy nod her head. She probably sees those all the time. Uh, you know, what, what reality is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good so. point. Great, great point. And, and okay. I'm, if I can ask one last question, Jared, you came in trying to get information and kind of ob observe what the conversation was. Do you have any thoughts, um, Jared? Um. I know I shared with, with some of you that were on the call from the beginning and and feel free to jump in as well because you've done more work with this, but uh, I did reference um, downtown councils imagine downtown 2030 strategic plan and for us um, downtown is defined from the river to 31st street state line on the west to approximately woodland on the east and so when you look at some of those neighborhoods you know that surround the, the central business district or the river market and and even then there could be some potential for for adus if you get creative with with some of the buildings but uh within that imagine downtown strategic plan uh, there is a component of, of housing and, and obviously we're very uh, aware of, of the housing debate and the importance uh, for housing across the spectrum you know we want to see more residents downtown and of course we want to see more uh, affordable housing and, and workforce housing and we understand the value in housing um, at all price points and so we see adus as a potential way to to help grow that um, housing unit number uh, and then also uh, specifically focus on potential ways to add uh, affordable housing to the mix and so as we prepare to, to roll out the plan publicly you know privately we've been able to meet um, with a lot of the city council members and update them on what's on the plan and so we're looking um, to do what we can to help you know support potential uh, policy when it gets to that point because we think this is uh, definitely something that's important for Kansas City and, and worth exploring more. That's great. That's terrific. Thanks. All right. Um, I think we should wrap up for now. Um, we've got really appreciate everybody showing up. We've got um, a good mailing list for all this now. And uh, I think we probably need to figure out what our next step is uh, as a group. Um, but this has been a really helpful discussion. Really appreciate everybody's time. And if anyone wants to join our coalition, it's the Livable KC Coalition. If anyone's interested in joining that, let us know because we're, our goal is to kind of work towards getting to the ordinance. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Walk around your neighborhood and look. Thank you. Walk around your neighborhood and look for those uh, ADUs that are hidden in plain sight. Like the Easter egg hunt. <laughs> <Okay. laughs>
Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. All right. Good night. Good night. Night.